Okay. Um, so first off today, we've got a period of public comment. Um, seeing as there are a number of visitors, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, we do ask that people limit themselves to about three minutes, just so we have enough time for plenty of speakers. So um, if you do want to speak, um, just uh, introduce yourself, please, so we all know who is speaking, and then go ahead and say your piece. Hi. I like if you're not speaking, turn off your microphones. Um, Oops. Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Dana. I would like to speak. I will have to say that I'm asking for about six minutes from the board, if that's okay. Um, go ahead, and you know, I just um, I'll try my hardest to go as fast, but I would like to read a, le a letter to the board, um, if possible. But um, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, is this the letter that we have all received? Um, I think so. I'm okay. pretty sure that, um, yeah. So, so hi, hi, my name is Dana Decker. I'm a special educator and a co-teacher of racial justice at Randolph Union High School. I'm also a parent of two elementary school children that attend RES. So I'm pretty invested in our school system in Randolph's public education. My co-teacher Emily Therian wrote a powerful letter to the community explaining what is needed for Randolph Union High School to be equitable so that every student feels safe when walking into our building. We have made this um, public statement over the weekend introducing the letter to some Randolph community members. We have fellow colleagues, alumni, current students and parents, community members who believe in this letter and its statements. We're asking for the board to listen and to commit to supporting our students so everyone has an equal and positive education. Um, and this should be an ongoing dialogue between all of us. And I was just wondering if I could take a couple minutes to read the letter. It should take like three minutes, I think. Um, dear, dear Orange Southwest School District community, the last nine minutes of George Floyd's life, like the untimely deaths of countless other people of color, serve as a stark reminder that this country has been shaped by four centuries of racial terror and injustice. It is with these abhorrent facts in mind that we publicly and irrefutably state that we commit to dismantling systematic racism in all of its forms because we believe in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s words, quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And because we know that racism and white supremacy are intricately connected to other forms of oppression, we are all committed to dismantling oppression based on social class, gender identity, sexual orientation, mental or physical ability, family ancestry, or in any other form in which it manifests. To our families and students of color, we see you and we are listening. We are filled with rage and grief at all of the ways that our society tells you that your lives matter less. We are committing to making school a place where you know how much you matter. We commit to providing you with the highest quality affirming curricula and teaching practices. We commit to ensuring you feel safe in our buildings and to fighting for your right to feel safe in our community and our country. We commit to challenging and educating ourselves to understand our own role in perpetuating systematic racism and to be allies and accomplices in the struggle to challenge and change these systems. We commit to making sure you have a seat at the decision-making table, to listen when you talk and to have your back when you need us. To our white families and students, we see you as well and we need you. We commit to also providing your children with the highest quality affirming curricula and teaching practices. And we know that in order to do that, we need to, to give them the skills and knowledge necessary to help build a different community. One in which every family has access to decent food, housing, healthcare, where every child feels safe at school and where every individual can live a lifelong of life of dignity. We know that many of you suffer from injustices as well, hunger, poverty, addiction, lack of health care, domestic violence, and sexism, and we commit to fighting against these inequities in your children's lives. 
to the OSSD board, we invite you to join us in condemning all forms of racism and injustice and to commit to dismantling inequalities within our community. In order to achieve this goal, we urge you to adopt the following measures. One, support for ongoing mandatory equity and anti-bias focused professional development for all OSSD and school employees including board members, coaches, substitutes, and new hires. Two, support for ongoing equity and anti-bias curriculum development training for all educators. Three, pledge to keep the Black Lives Matter flag flying at the high school until our students and young people no longer suffer from inst institutionalized racism in this country. Four, support for legislative initiatives at state and local levels that advance educational equity. And last, support recruitment and retention efforts for leaders, teachers, and staff of color. Sorry, that wasn't the last, I have two more and then I'll be done. Um, commit to outreach and support efforts for family of color, families living in poverty, and families suffering from any form of structural or individual bias. And now last, and this, is, I think, is a very important one that I'd like you to consider along with the others that we established by August 1st, a representative equity action committee composed of teachers, administrators, community members, parents and students to oversee the above efforts. I'd like to share this letter with you. I could put it in um, the Google chat right now for you. Um, we'd like to hear back from you within the next week or so after reading the letter and taking it into consideration. And we're asking the board to write resolutions and commit to hiring an equity ac action committee. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Um, to the board right now. Laura, can I just get the names of the, the phone numbers that don't come up with names on them? Because I don't know who's attending. There's three phone numbers that have no names. Right, would those people please um, give their names so we know who's in attendance? <clears throat> How do we know which ones don't have names? Uh, you don't have a name. Okay, Cynthia Jackson. Thank you. So anyone with a phone who's calling in by phone won't have a name pop up on our screens. There's one ending in 18, one ending in 21, and one ending in 98. Well, you won't be on the minutes if I don't have who you are. Yeah, we do ask that people identify themselves just so we know who's present during an open meeting like this. Sure. They may not know how to unmute themselves. That could be. Okay. Um, is there any other public comment at this time? Hello? Yes. Uh, I'm a number that ends in 18, and my name is Nancy Rice calling by phone. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. That, Nancy. Thank you. This what do I do to unmute? <laughs> <laughs> you were un now you're unmuted. I'm not exactly sure how you mute yourself again. Uh, well, I'll try to be quiet then, unless I want to say something. <laughs> Just hit the same icon again. The little microphone. So here, here's Richard Doolin. Um, Hi. So my, I have a uh, question. Are you going to cover um, what school, this new school year is going to look like um, come September? Do you have an action plan? Are you planning to share it with the community um, and et cetera? I know it's really, it's all new to everybody. And um, what are your, what are your ideas that you're going to share that tonight? We are not. Um, it, it actually really, as you say, is way too new. Um, and it really is not a board role. Um, the board does not um, set an action policy in that way. Um, basically, the board, um, our board, 
is responsible to oversee the administration. Um, we are uh, Lane Millington, the superintendent's boss. So um, we keep our focus on him. Um, our policies for governance are available on our website if you're interested. So we are responsible for financial oversight and really for uh, overseeing Lane to make sure that he is adhering with the goals that we have set, which we call ENDS. And so our ENDS are educational ENDS. Um, and so we, you know, we keep our eyes to see whether he is actually managing to accomplish the goals for which we have set him uh, and the district. Um, now, policy for next year, for instance, um, is going to be set by the state, by the governor and the Department of Health and the Department of Education, the same way that um, we just responded to the directives from the state in March when they uh, you know, decided first to um, make school out of session and then canceled it entirely. So those directives did come down from the state and then individual districts decided um, in this case collaboratively in the first um, couple of days of in-service, which was March 18th and 19th, I believe, um, sort of how they were going to react to those directives um, and set up uh, committees for dealing with food delivery to kids and connectivity and, um, and you know, making continual learning plans and things like that. Coming down, we understand that hopefully by the end of June, um, the governor and those two committees, uh, departments, the health and education, will have some preliminary guidelines for what they expect the fall to look like. Those directives will be similarly handed to the district, districts, state of Vermont, and then um, right now, the last few days of school will be spent, maybe, if these directives do come down in time, as, as uh, staff and administration get together to, to hammer out what school might look like. Um, we really are, as a board, we oversee again the process, but we, we don't um, delve into those processes at all. Um, so right now we'll wait and see um, when, you know, when it becomes a little bit clearer from the state um, what the parameters for reopening or running school will look like. Okay, thank you. That, that actually, what you told me is probably, well, is helpful to me and probably all the other teachers and et cetera that might be uh, watching and listening right now. Thank you. Good. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, I'd like to make one. This is Nora Skolnick, um, teacher at Randolph Elementary School and Braintree resident. Um, also the uh, co-president of the um, Teachers Association. Um, I'd like to ask the board to um, reconsider their position on opening um, negotiations for some side agreements on the um, working conditions for all the employees in the district. So I'd just like to formally put that out there again. Hi, Nora. Um, as you know, we've um, discussed this twice, um, quite at length. Um, uh, we had two, one special meeting and one uh, regular meeting, and we did discuss this at length. We have decided sin that since really we are in negotiations currently for the next two years, and this school year ends on June 30th. Um, so being as this has been such a tumultuous time for everyone in the community, um, no less for teachers, I understand that, but that we are, in, as we are in current negotiations for next year, we don't want to revisit um, this current school year at this time. So I, I would like to just respond to that. Um, the negotiations that we are in is for a new CBA. What we're talking about is um, dealing with some issues on current working conditions, even though I realize that the school year is almost over, um, but it will continue over the summer months for um, maintenance workers and um, some other um, possibly um, special education teachers and other support staff. Um, and there are some issues that still can be resolved over things that happened this school year. And, um, and the CBA language does not deal with some of the things that, that have been coming up 
um, as issues with remote learning. So it would take a separate set of negotiations for that. We're not asking to change the CBA. We know that those proposals have been put out and are being dealt with um, with the negotiations team. Um, this would be a, talking about doing some side agreements to deal with some of those issues. I think, I mean, I, I think we, we are pretty firm that we don't want to um, reopen negotiations, Nora, but we can discuss it in executive session tonight again and uh, revisit it as a board. Can, can I just ask a question? So are there some new issues that have come up or is it the same issues that we already talked about previously? Um, well, it's, it's always so hard to predict as I think everybody knows and, and as um, Laura has pointed out that, you know, things are changing all the time and, and directives are coming out. So, so we're trying to, you know, predict what some of those things would look like. Um, there are possibly some issues and I mean, it's really just to, to look at the, the safety and, and equity issues that, that we have discussed. Um, for, for things that are in the building that would affect possibly students as well as staff members that are working there. Um, procedures for disinfection, um, disinfecting rooms, um, cleaning, those sorts of things are, are coming up right now and um, it would be good to discuss them and, and make sure that that we're all on, on working, you know, I think we are all working towards the same goals, but making sure that we're all on the same page about that and have agreements in place. I think it, it protects both the, the students, it protects the staff and it protects the board to have those in, in place. Do any other board members have other questions of Nora? around this issue? Anne, you're, you're, you felt that, like your question was answered as fully as you wanted? Yeah, it sounds like there's maybe some other issues that, they're, that they've thought of that might be an issue over the summer, perhaps. Um, when does this, the current CBA ends as of July, uh, June 30th? June 30th of this year. Um, and then until a successor agreement is reached, we're under the same um, language agreement with the CBA that we have currently. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions from anyone, any other? Yeah, comments? I have a, a comment, um, Richard Doolin. So I, I, I don't know everything that Nora is talking about, but I, I do know a couple of items that, that she's she's been looking at, and um, she's she's pretty firm about the different things, especially with kids returning in September, um, you know. And so, on negotiation aspect, which I was a part of, um, I support Nora and what she was saying and and what she wants to accomplish. Could, could I just add, this is Tev Kalman, um, RUHS teacher um, and OSCA vice president, um, that I think if, if for us, it's, it's not a matter of whether the negotiation happens through a sidebar process over an MOU or through the current CBA negotiations. It's a matter of really wanting to make sure that our voices are being heard as we move into this unknown new phase of what public education yeah. looks like, yeah. where I think that um, every day or every week we're discovering new things that we couldn't have possibly have anticipated in the contract. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're definitely willing to work with a process that, that makes sense for everybody. Um, I think, and we understand also that in many ways um, your hands are tied, you know, when it comes to directives coming down from Secretary French's office. Um, 
We also believe pretty strongly that in the principle that the people who are going to implement whatever school looks like in the fall need to be at the table. And I think that um, it was it was hard in having our request to bargain repeatedly rejected to feel confident that that um, was happening. So that's I feel like that's that's the message I came here just to, to make sure you understand. Like we we appreciate you all. We appreciate the work you do. We appreciate the strain you're under. Um, we don't do this to be combative, but we are genuinely concerned about um, a wait and see approach or a business as usual approach at a time where clearly that is not, um, we're not in business as usual. And we want to make sure that those of us who I think have an understanding of the day to day logistics of what will and will not work in terms of what in person socially distance learning and or long-term um you know technological distance learning what it needs to look like in order to be safe in order to be sustainable in order to be equitable um and so that's that's just the message that i would like to convey to the board thank you for listening i i think tev and you know really this is a public comment not a discussion period of time here in our meeting so um probably all the board members are going to fire me but anyway i think Really, we feel um, that those issues that you're bringing up are issues that the administration, as you as teachers, professionals, staff, you know, whether it's food, you know, whoever's involved with those discussions, really, um, that's in that venue. It's not really a negotiations venue. This is a, a, a venue if you want to impact the way education is being delivered and kids are being kept safe, or, or, you know, and to you know, whether it's remote learning or on site learning, that those are things that are going to happen, you know, as staff members, as administrators, as you grapple with, you know, the, the directives and whatever the health situation looks like in uh, August, September, October. You know, I, we as a board really, that's not our role. I mean, we, we, our policies actually say we do not interact one of with staff right we're not teachers we're not professional education professionals in any sense of the word right we're community members who are doing this job you know so it's um can, this is not our strong point here <laughs> or really I, our I, role you know I, I i can i just respond briefly I, I appreciate that i think that we we're appealing to you because you are sort of the highest power that we have access to at this point in terms of the things that i think we consistently hear from our administrators and other leaders kind of more at the ground level are be are beyond their control yeah. right and so i think that we are because we know that that there's at least some um you know discussion between say this the uh, OSSD school board and the Vermont School Boards Association, which certainly I think, does have a voice in, in these things. And so we're just trying to um, communicate, I guess, through to you and perhaps through you. Um, May so, I add? Well, I appreciate that there are probably things that you are not able to, to do in this venue. And if I could add just one, one more piece to that. Um, what we're looking for is is, is district-wide policy of, of setting up a task force that is district-wide. Um, yes, individual schools and administrators might be doing that. As a matter of fact, the elementary school um, principals have set that up for that level. But if we're looking for systemic policy, um, that needs to be district-wide, not building by building. Um, and the other piece I just wanted to, to very quickly add is that um, while the board has po policy governance, it is with the board that we negotiate these agreements with, um, and therefore it is the legal responsibility of the board to enter into, if there is going to be those side agreements, to enter into those side agreements. That's not something that we do with um, administrators. That's something that we do with, with the school board. Thank you. Um, this is Ashley, and I just have one quick clarifying question, and it's for Nora or Tevya. Um, the the request that you're speaking about, the additional this um, group, this committee, has that been documented in detail and distributed 
and perhaps something that I just missed as to what you're looking for, because um, I feel like this is a relatively vague discussion on, on what is being asked for. So has that actually been detailed in a way that if it is in our purview, the way you suggest that we could actually be reviewing to understand fully what's being asked of us? Sure, I, I, I want to make sure that I'm understanding your question. Um, the, are you talking about having setting up a district wide task force? Oh, so I keep on muting and unmuting myself, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I, I guess I want to make sure that I'm clear. So that's great, Nora. I'm, maybe you and I both are speaking. So, um, you know, over the weekend, I started to receive um, quite a few emails um, requesting action from the school board. And again, um, it was a bit vague in nature on what was being asked. And again, I feel like this discussion right now is a bit vague. So sure. What is being asked? Sure. There, when, there, when we talk about the, like, um, you know, concerns uh, of, for our maintenance staff over the summer being in the schools. I don't really know what that means. Sure. Um, thank you. I, I can be very clear and very succinct. We have we have two main asks, um, and one is I I will grant you is a, is a new one. Um, that is having the district wide task force set up. Um, so, so the two asks that we have of the board is one, to set up a district-wide task force that has representation from um, all employees and community members as well. So that would include um, school nurses, um, guidance counselor representation, um, teacher representation, maintenance worker representation, um, food services, as well as community member representation, um, parents. Um, so that that is one ask, and that is, an, is a new ask because um, this is for looking at the reopening of schools and how the, that's going to be um, done so that it is in a safe and equitable way for our students and all of our staff members. Um, the second ask that we have is to open up negotiations for side agreements, and that would be two separate side agreements. One would be for professional staff and one would be for support staff um, side agreements, and that deals with the current working conditions and possible future working conditions um, and, and how we're depending on how things are in the fall. That, that ask has been ongoing all along. So I hope that clarifies things. And, and when you, you're asking about the, the specifics, I think that's what we're saying that we really need a task force to um, look at what those specifics are. That's not something that I'm prepared to speak to and go through a list on tonight. I, I have a question also. So, Again, th there seem to be two different issues. I want to focus on the on the input from from. So, are you concerned about this because of the way things were implemented when this all first came down in the spring? Was it the way the management made think, those decisions, or what? I mean, where is this coming from? It, because you must have had like a negative experience to say, whoa, when we start up in the fall, we, we need to have this group. Or is this just sort of your idea of this is the way that we see it from our professional perspective that the school should be doing this, which again is all management oriented, which is not the purview of our board, but I'm just curious, is that what this is about? I think that administrators have done the best that they possibly can do under the circumstances that were given to them. Um, and I, and I want to give them credit for that. I think they have tried um, super hard to, to do that. However, I think there are things that they have missed because they are not kind of, you know, um, on the ground. <laughs> doing the actual teaching um, 
And by not having that task force, I think that there were things that were missed um, and, and should have been put in place and hopefully can be put in place um, for the future. Could I just add to that? This is Tev again. Um, I, yeah, I would, I would agree. I don't want to point fingers or fault. I mean, I think that everyone did the best they could. I want to say, you know, to your question, Aaron, I think a little bit of where this is coming from, for me, is like having been a public school teacher for more than a decade and seeing the way that these decisions get made and, and seeing how initiatives and plans that are very detailed come from outside of the school building. Um, and whether that's about uh, changes to grading or classroom practice or, and many of them very worthy and well-intentioned, but what very rarely happens is, are we asked at the beginning in shaping how these changes to our school, these well-intentioned and in many cases, very necessary changes to the school are going to go, um, we get told how it's going to go and then we figure out how to adapt to it. I, I, I mean, please, if there's someone on this call who teaches in a public school who disagrees with that characterization, please speak up. But I think that that has been our experience and we understand that what happened this spring was an emergency, an unprecedented pandemic that I don't think that we fairly could ask anyone to have seen coming for and planned, but I think it's a real mistake for us to think that going back to school in the fall is the same situation. I think it is a, clearly there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think that we can begin the process now of asking the people who know best what will work, right? And I think to, to you know, that, that includes asking students, um, Sorry, I, I'm going to repeat things I've already said. I don't want to take people's time, but I, I hope that answers your question, right? So it wasn't necessarily like a specific um, failing that we felt like needed to be called out. It's more that we know the way that these decisions get made and the stakes are too high in this situation for us to just wait and see, you know, and wait to find out what, what our role is and our purview is. Um, when we feel like we have information and expertise about what is and isn't going to work um that that we would like to be on the same page helping to to um shape that vision from the very beginning are you um suggesting this is laura again are you suggesting that um people are going to be paid to be on this task force or is this going to be a volunteer um sort of operation gathering meeting I hadn't gotten that far, had you, Nora? No, I don't envision um, it being being paid. I think I think some of that that depends on on how it's structured. Um, I'm just wondering if this is going to cost the district. I mean, that sounds like a lot of people for you know if that's days worth. That's that's an expense that we need to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. yeah, fair, fair enough. I, again, correct me, Nora, if you, if you disagree, I don't think that the union would in any way want to be insisting that people paid in a way that undermined the ability of the task force to happen. You know? right. Like, so I, I, I can't like answer that question, but, but I think our, what we want is for there to be a team of stakeholders helping to shape this decision. I don't think that we're going to put up um, procedural roadblocks to that. Mm -hmm. If that's something that you're all amenable to and right. how to do it. Like, this is, uh, just for a second. Oh. Um, so I think Tev is trying to say, you know, the boots on the ground, having that, those folks, are the primary part of the task force, like myself being maintenance, Tev being a teacher, uh, Nora being, being a teacher, uh, some paraeducators, some cooks, and the people that are in the battleground itself on this virus, are you know part of that task force i think is what he's trying to say that's all i need to say this is uh brian i'd like to make one comment about you know this is really from from that the numerous emails we've gotten this week this is the first that we've heard about this task force so saying that the board has you know continually denied this task force has been it's, it's not really what's happened 
This is the first time we've heard of it is from those emails this week. And you had requested to renegotiate for compensation on working conditions, but there was not anything made about the task force until this week when that landslide of emails came through. So, so the task force is something that has been brought up uh, at different levels before reaching the board um, and has been asked. Um, and, and the, the part that, that has been asked of the board repeatedly um, has been to have those negotiations and um, um, for those side agreements. And, and that is something that, that we have been repeatedly turned down about. Um, and, and I also would like to point out that um, most of the items that, that we're talking about in terms of, of um, the side agreement um, for, the, for the working conditions are not things that cost um, money. There, there are things like um, not evaluating um, teachers at this point in time um, over remote learning when we all don't have, you know, this is the, the first we've ever experienced teaching in this manner. Um, things like in, ensuring that um, if my spouse overhears a conversation that I'm having with students that um, I'm not held liable for that. That that confidentiality um, is 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 not going to um, come into play and come back and, and have then something um, come uh, against me for for that. Um, there there were a few th items that we wanted to discuss. I, I understand that did cost money, um, but also again talking about equity, we have um, staff members who have no internet access at home, high speed internet access, and yet are being asked to teach remotely, and then they have to go sit in front of um, you know the library or school building so that they can work with their students. Or, or turn in plans, um, and, and that's the, a working condition that they're still struggling with right now. And if we have to go back to remote learning, they would be struggling with that again. So those are the sorts of issues that we're, we are trying to deal with. Um, how to have support staff um, make sure that, that for the, the maintenance workers that they that they have the protections that they need in order to be cleaning um, the buildings and making sure that the buildings are safe for us to be in and for our students to be in. Um, making sure, again, that they have the supplies that, and the things that they need in order to do their jobs well. So those are the sorts of issues that are not going to go away in the fall. Um, I think given the uncertainties of, of how long we're going to be able to be in school um, with our classes and even with th those uncertainties, how many students can be in a room or um, the, the nitty gritty details of how do we have lunch um, and, and make sure that teachers have the um, prep time and the, and the their lunch break so they can have 10 minutes so it's supposed to be 20 minutes to to snarf down their lunch um but or to have some planning time that they're going to be needing um when we're probably going to be having to be with our students during those lunch periods um, as they're eating in the classroom or how else to organize the eating in the classroom. So there are, are working conditions there that I think we need to discuss. Um, and, and I know I've we've, we've taken up a lot of time on this issue. I think it, it is, however, critical for our students that this be dealt with. Um, and, and I also want to point out that um, it's the law. <laughs> Um, legally, this is part of the job of, of the, um, the union um, to be looking at these working conditions and when there's a change in working conditions to be negotiating these side agreements um, so that we have everybody protected. Okay, is there anyone else who would like to comment? Um... Um, hello. Hi, um, I would like to first ask if I do have floor to speak here. My name is Brittany Malik. I'm an RUHS alum. Um, and I would just like to ask a clarifying question about what we're talking about here, as well as just a follow up um, request of what has been requested already. Um, my first question is the equity committee team we're talking about right now is something that was also mentioned in the letter 
from Anna Decker. Is that correct? Is that the same team we're, committee we're talking about or no? Okay, perfect. This is about the work um, and supporting of teachers, staff members in the schools during our, uh, our pandemic time right now. Perfect. I wanted to confirm that. Um, and then I just wanted to bring it back to the, um, I didn't speak in time when it was brought up by Dana Decker about the letter that was brought forth. Um, I just wanted to um, speak and support and request that we reconsider looking at this if I have the grounds to do that. Um, I believe in terms of what is being asked in some of these remarks in this letter, I feel like some of these can be potentially looked at at least or taken on in the same realm as asking for help from our highest um, people of authority in this regard. Um, I am not familiar, I will be honest, with the deep inner workings of how school boards work and all of that, I will be completely honest. Um, but from what I could gather, um, at least graduation requirements are an important part of what you oversee in that regard. And I understand from what you described that it is something that you get from the state and that potentially you have to wait for the state to give you these procedures before you can implement or potentially even request changes. Um, and in that regard, I would um, just ask and um, re-bring up just some of the um, points that were in the letter, including the um, looking at educational equity in general in the schools, as well as um, recruitment efforts and retention efforts for leaders, teachers, staff of color in our community. Thanks, Brittany. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak? I just have a, a um, brief just, comment. This, um, this is Cynthia Jackson. Um, okay, go ahead, Cynthia. Uh, just um, feeling that we do learn from experience, and I'm just wondering what, what good could come of all concerned uh, hearing what has been learned by those on the ground uh, during this past school year. Why can't so, that happen? What, whether, um, why is it constantly denied? It's, uh, it's, it's really a matter of sharing what peop some people know and other people can't possibly know until they are told. I guess I'm not sure exactly what you're saying is being denied. Uh, a hearing. Uh, we've, sitting, we've... Down, sitting down uh, and listening to uh, people who have had the experience uh, how they have viewed it, what they see would be an improvement in the school, in these schools that we are all so essentially concerned about. Sharing the wealth of experience. What, what's bad about that? Uh, nothing at all. We're not opposed to that. Um, that the board meeting really is not that forum. However, um, we no. that's just not the work we do. But all I'm saying is that that sort of forum is absolutely valuable. I have, but it it's just not my purview um, as as a board chair. Um, it certainly is a very valuable discussion as a school or as a district um, to be doing that. I have I don't disagree with you. Is that something that uh, you could implement from your position? Um, I can speak, it might, might be a little bit easier. On the, uh, the idea of kind of the district level committee to kind of look at the reopening, um, the reality is, is that that was always on the plan, at least at the school level. Um, there is a group of people that is district representative for all the elementary folks that started out as kind of uh, made a request about a week or so ago, which was a good request. They wanted to go out and they wanted to examine what the other countries were doing that had opened up their schools and just see what they could learn from that in anticipation 
of when the state, you know, gave us the directives on on how things would reopen. And that committee is evolving into kind of a, a bigger committee that, you know, will be handed that template to work on their schools. And that includes everybody across the board. The high school level is going to have to put some some folks together as well. It doesn't mean that they can't meet at a, as a K to 12 team. Um, but in terms of requests for this district wide team, I have received no email on it. And the first that I heard about it, the district wide team was actually today in a conversation with the union. We did meet on Friday and they did mention, hey, you know, it would be good if we had, you know, some input. And at that point in time, you know, I mentioned to them and said, hey, um, you know, we're still waiting on what comes down from the state and the agency of education, recognize that most of what they give us will be directives. There will be some small things um, based on those directives that people will have to decide that are really content specific to the schools, but certainly. Um, but this is a bigger uh, a bigger question. I think it's already evolving, it's already happening and there's no problems with it. People just have to ask and, and ask clearly um, is, is all I can say. So I appreciate it and I appreciate the, the, the push for it because it's a good idea. <clears throat> Who is just speaking? Uh, sorry about that. I forgot you're not on uh, on, right. on uh, camera. Uh, Lane Millington, superintendent. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any comments from anyone else who has not yet spoken? Uh, yes, this is Nancy Rice. I'm still confused on... Uh, why there isn't a way for the teachers to share their experience that they've had these last few months um, and be heard about it. Lane, do you want to take that on? I, I don't see, I don't know of any reason that they haven't or couldn't have shared yeah, I'm their not, experience. I'm not sure if you're referring to their request to open negotiations or if you're referring to uh, a group on the reopening of school. I'm referring to them sharing their their experience from this past several months so everyone can benefit from it. There's absolutely no reason why. Um, you know, they're requesting to come together to help kind of shape the reopening effort. Um, but again, we don't know what that reopening effort and what the directives are from the state yet. They plan on having that template and that guidance out, I believe, in about a week and a half. Um, and so until that comes out, that is the piece that will shape that discussion and what people have to look at and come up with ideas around. So right now we're just kind of waiting a little bit. As you said earlier, there is a group from the elementary um, level from probably a week or two ago that had asked to just take a look at what other schools were doing on the healthcare kind yes, of side of things. Yeah, with the nurses. So that, that piece was, those, that information was already being exchanged. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I apologize. Oh, no, no. I didn't. So I, I just want to speak up for a second. So one of our roles as a board is advocacy. So, um, and Tav, you had mentioned, you know, you, you're so used to getting these directives coming in to telling you what to do. If you have some ideas of things that you want us as a board, to send out to the legislators and to send out to the, the school board association. Um, let us know, let us know before we get these directives that are telling you to do things that you think are not in the best interests of, of teachers and students and, and how we're gonna function in these, in these uncertain times. That is, that is a role that we can take. And, and as a board, we have a certain amount of, well, <laughs> maybe <laughs> a certain amount of power. Um, but, you know, that, that's something that, that uh, you know, we really, that's one of our roles as board members is to advocate for, for our district, for our students, for our staff at the state level. So if there are things that you want us to speak up about, please let us let us know before we get these directives and you're like, oh no, here we go again. I appreciate that, Anne. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we will definitely 
uh, take that into consideration and try to to turn something around that is 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 useful because that is definitely um, one of the things that we're hoping to get out of this out of this meeting. And and I would say you know I think that the big principle is to advocate for a task force like this in every school district in the state, right? Because again, certain number of things make sense to make se to make that decision on a centralized level, but I think the vast majority of really important granular details have to be decided on a local basis. So I, can I just say one more, one more thing just in response to some of this confusion between the MOU and the, um, the request for this task force? Absolutely acknowledge that the request for the task force is a, is a new request. I would like to point out though, that I think that many of the issues that um, would no doubt come up if such a task force were assembled, um, I think are pretty specifically covered in an MOU. I think some of the major concerns, you know, speaking as a classroom teacher, have to do with having the time and resources that I need to actually meet kids' needs, um, while also, you know, raising a child and about to be two children of my own. Um, and I think that the the message, the implicit message that we were hearing from the board by the refusal to negotiate was essentially a a, a refusal to recognize the change in our working conditions. Um, and so I think at that point, our, and, and I also want to point out that, you know, some of the other things in the MOU that it talks about um, just have to do with ensuring that we have the, the physical safety and material resources, um, not mostly about pay, more about like a reasonable number of kids, a reasonable number of uh, responsibilities, a recognition that before the pandemic and all of the things that it brings out, our, um, our plates were pretty full and that if new things are going to be added on without adding uh, resources, it's, it's, or without radically rethinking how we um, use the resources we have, it's going to mean um, less for each kid, right? And that's what we're trying to to avoid. So I just wanted to like, again, make the point that we're not, it is not an act of bad faith or deceit that we started by asking for an MOU and that it has grown into a request um, for this task force. They, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're two parts of the same whole. So I just wanted to like clarify that intent. I think direct and honest messaging is your best resource um, and rather than making this an us versus them sort of dynamic. Um, but let's move on. If there's anyone else who would like to say something who has not already yet spoken, that would be great. And then we really do need to move on. Hi, uh, my name is Sultana Khan. And um, I used to be a paraprofessional at the elementary school. I haven't lived in Vermont for some time, but I have recently moved home. Um, and I just wanted to ask kind of a process question because I have yet to attend a board meeting for uh, before um, and wanted to also thank Brittany for speaking up earlier. Uh, and, and, and just wanna say that um, I'm really appreciating the diversity of thought that is happening on this this call um, and how uh, how you are intentionally trying to address each issue. So I'm hoping that my process question will lead to the same result, which is that now that you have this statement um, that has been signed by what seems like at least 100 community members on racial injustice, what does the process for the board look like moving forward on how to address the requests that are listed in that statement? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, it's a, it's a complicated issue. It's also a very timely issue. And so I think, you know, it's something that we need to discuss sooner rather than later. Um, I think, you know, we'll have to decide like, how do we grapple with such, you know, a, a large ask, not by the letter, but just by the sort of the, um, intent of how, I mean, these are deep seated issues that are not easy to fix. And, you know, so therefore we need to go, I, I can't remember, Dana had maybe had seven um, 
sort of um, parts of that. Um, but we need to sort of go one by one and say, okay, so how does this, is this a board role? You know, what is our role in addressing or, you know, um, passing this off to another entity or another part of uh, the school district? Or is this something we want to ask the staff and teachers and students to grapple with? For instance, the one that popped into my mind was the Black Life Lies Lives Matter flag, which was the focus of really a very focused, um, many um, month long dialogue between many community members, um, student led, teacher uh, facilitated. It was really a, an excellent um, example of, of community communication and discussion. And what came out of that was honoring to the students who put many hours of work into that. That is not an issue that I would take up. You know, students and teachers, the kids who invested their time and effort into managing and facilitating those discussions, that's something I would push back to them in the fall and say, okay, guys, you know, how do you see this going forward and where do we want to take that? So for that flag, um, flying the flag year round, that would be their issue. Some of the others, as far as, um, you know, equity and hiring and treating kids and things like that, those, you know, definitely have to be part of our thinking as a school district. And how are we going to address those issues? As far as professional development, I just jotted a few down, so I can't answer all seven, but um, professional development, that too is something that, you know, is in our CBA, how many professional development days we do we have? And how do we want to allocate those? That's an administrative decision. You know, do we want to say several of those days or one of those days is going to go to addressing this issue of racial equity? And how, you know, how do we, how do we do that? How do we manage that? Um, so I think, you know, I hope I'm answering your question, Sultana, but, you know, I think we're going to have to think through sort of the, the breadth of that, um, of that letter and all that, that, that was laid out in it. And, and I will just say, you know, it was interesting to hear um, Anne mention that you are, you know, part of your mission is advocacy, given the nature of this request. Um, I certainly recognize that this meeting has already gone on for an hour and I'm not trying uh, to harp on things that have no clear path moving forward, but I am wondering how, um, aside from potentially like virtual meetings, uh, this could be a transparent process within the community uh, that utilizes collective leadership moving forward. So, uh, you know, I was asking kind of like for a specific process, which it sounds like the process is discussion amongst board members uh, per action item. Um, and I am wondering kind of given that this, you know, the totality of what the asks are requires community endorsement and input. Um, how that process will continue to be transparent to community members and teachers and students. Quite honestly, this was not an agenda item. And usually we don't discuss things that are not on our agenda. We're now an hour in and um, most of this has not been on our, none of it's been on our agenda. So when things pop up like this, you know, we're sort of thinking on our feet. And this is something we're going to have to put on an agenda and have, you know, interested community members, staff, etc., come and present, you know, how they feel like this should, should move forward. Perhaps this is a place where we should have a community forum, maybe not led by the school board, maybe led by the OSSD district as a whole to discuss these issues. That's really helpful. Thank you, because I am literally only asking process questions right now. I'm 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 not trying to get you to respond to any of the agenda, uh, any of the items in the letter at this moment. I am really just asking what it looks like moving forward so that there is accountability about how these items are met. Thanks. I mean, that that's it's a really good question. OK, do we have anyone else? Hearing none. Um, I 
I have a question. Um, my name's Jonathan Harrison. Um, I was until recently an employee um, of the school district working as a custodian. And one of my concerns for when school reopens and you know the safety of the people being there is that as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been enough um, staff for, as far as custodians go to really do uh, their job effectively. And I'm concerned if there's going to be more uh, stringent cleaning procedures, how that's going to be performed unless new staff is hired. Uh, that would be a question for the administration, um, specifically Lane. And, you know, right now we've, as schools have been closed for so long, um, you know, it, I'm sure that we're going to need more more custodial staff, likely anyway. And so, but that's a question for administration and not for us at this point. All right. Okay. I have to present. I, oops, sorry about that. Um, you did you want to answer to that question, or you you go have another question, Jonathan? Um, I just wanted to present that as an issue um, that you know needs resolving, just um, because of the state, you know the safety of uh, teachers and other staff that will be returning to the school. If there's not enough custodians to um, do their job, then surfaces won't get cleaned and more possibility of contamination and a, a potential hazard. Yeah, so if, depending upon what's happening with the coronavirus, we do have enough staff. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the current situation. Um, part of one of the, the, the things in terms of um, compassion that the district has done and all districts across the state has done is that, that folks that fit into the, these categories that made it unsafe for them to be at work, either because of age or infirm, infirmity or who they were taking care of at home, um, have been allowed to stay home with pay. Um, the problem is, is that in our district of the 70 um, support staff that we have, of which the custodians are part, 68% of them are out on that leave. Um, so right now, because of that, you know, we are shorthanded. They have positions, those positions are guaranteed. Um, but while we are paying them while they are out, and again, something that we want to do, um, we cannot hire in their place to have folks come in because our budget is limited. You know, we get one lump sum of money at the beginning of the year, and that's all we have to run the entire year on. Um, so it's a complicated issue. Um, one of the reasons that we've been restrictive about, um, you know, staff in the buildings only being in there on certain days is to take into account the fact that, um, you know, where the support staff, what their levels are making sure that they can go in and follow all Vermont Health and CDC guidelines in terms of the cleaning, which has been done, right? If we had all the staff in every day, you're right, it would not be possible with the staffing levels that we that we have right now. Um, but that's one of the reasons that we've kind of restricted those those days to right now, just Thursday and Friday. Um, so good question, and I, pre I appreciate it. All right, um, thank you. I just want, just gonna say one more thing. Um, as far as the there not being enough staff, that's been something that notice has gone on even before um, the school closed down. So potentially an issue anyways. Thank you. Okay, um, let's move on to the first uh, part of our, our regular meeting. Um, we need to review the draft of the annual OSSD board agenda, which is include included in our agenda packet. Um, we did a, sort of a look over of this last month. Um, does anyone from the board have any comment of anything that we need to add? Um, okay. Our, I didn't hear anyone, so I'm assuming that everyone was okay with everything that's on our annual agenda, um, or if you haven't looked at it, um, we can always change it as we, as uh, things need to be added, whether it's a committee or things like that. But I, 
I would like to approve then that um, draft annual agenda. Do I have a, a motion to approve it? Uh, this is Ashley, and I move that we approve the 2021 draft agenda for the OSSD board. This is Brian. I second it. All those in favor, please uh, wave, I guess. <laughs> All right, looks like we have any opposed. All right, good. Um, that is approved. So that we'll have that to work with going forward. Um, next, we have uh, to discuss negotiations with unions. Um, Lane or any of the negotiating teams, do you want to uh, talk about that? Yeah, I can pipe up and then um, if I'm missing something, I think the team can can uh, pipe up as well. Um, in terms of the support staff, the support staff in the district have reached a tentative one-year agreement um, that's gonna be presented to the board once the final language is worked out. Um, it's a little hard to get the language back and forth over remote sessions and remote meetings. Um, but the basic gist of it is that the uh, support staff um, is it's 3% raise, um, one to three vacation days for school year employees, depending upon years of service. Um, and those will not be taken on days with um, students present. And then making sure that their contracts are in hand by May 1st. Um, as things stand currently by May 1st, they have to be notified of who is going to be offered a contract. Um, they ask just to have the contracts on May 1st. Um, so I don't know if there's questions or if there's anything important that I, I missed in the overall summary. You guys are too quiet. Yeah, I, I, I've got a comment. Um, yep. I believe, and Nora, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, on the vacation time that's added for this, um, the uh, paraeducators, um, there's only one day that can't be used um, during school. Am I wrong on that? Yeah, it's um, the, it depends on your years of service. The days that you had there already can be used um, any time with administrator approval, but all, new, but all of the new days that have been added can only be used um, on, on days that students are not in session. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, teacher negotiations, um, there were a lot of positive changes, uh, I think, on both sides when it came to kind of issues of language. Um, you know, one of the, the, the big ones um, that I think both sides seem to be happy with um, was, you know, the teachers are, are looking at getting their sick bank and they did give up some of their, their sick time to do that. Um, sticking point is salary. So we are on our way to mediation. Um, actually, we got some union members here, so you, you might be able to clarify this for me. Um, when I was looking over stuff today. Um, at the beginning, the teachers um, asked for 17% over two years. They did come down a bit. They offered a package deal of 10.8% over two years, um, but they had some language in that package that this was only if the other language were included. So I don't know if that means that right now we're at 10.8% or if we're back to the no. 17. No, we're... we're um... I, I believe, and I'm not on that team, so, yep. I, but I believe that um, it's uh, the current request is 4.9% um, new money um, the first year and 5.9% new money the second year. That's um, the 10%, 10.8% 10 over two years. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And um, so that's where I think things were left off. Okay, good. Yeah, because like I said, there was some wording in the, the package that that was included in that said, you know, union had the right to rescind if the package wasn't accepted in full. Um, the In terms of the district itself, it offered 3.2% over the next two years. And I think both sides agreed that, you know, it would be good to have, um, you know, another set of eyes on this. Three. Um, which, okay, I'm sorry, Lane. I don't recall the 3.2% new money. Over for, two years. So 1.6% first year, 1.6% second year. Saying. Okay, thank yeah, you. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think of it in that way. So it's hard. I was trying to adjust. And so I think um, we had, I don't, I haven't heard anything yet. I know that uh, the district's council and the union are working to set up the mediation se session. Um, I don't know how delayed or, 
problematic that will be, you know, with everything happening remotely. Um, but I expect hopefully we'll see, we'll hear on a meeting and we can get the, the, the next parts of this kind of banged out and, and on the path. Um, so questions, thoughts, excuse me, thoughts. Thank you. <clears throat> Add the, the you didn't add it. I don't believe the grievance language in, to all of that. I don't know yeah, that was happened. there was a lot. Like I said, there was a lot of really good positive changes on both sides in terms of in terms of language, okay. um, which was good. And so what Nora is talking about was um, one of the requests for the last couple of years uh, from the district was just trying to balance out the days in the grievance process so that we both had equal time to respond. Um, so that that was a good a good piece that came up. Okay, um, if there's nothing else about the union negotiations, both staff and professional, then we'll, uh, we need to a, appoint an auditor uh, for the finances for next year. Um, in our packet, we saw that um, Robin Pembroke had um, recommended that we engage Father Gail Siegel and Valley um, again at, for another year. They were the ones who presented the, the re audit last month. Um, is there any discussion about that, or do I have a motion to approve um, Father Gail, Father Gail Siegel, and Valley as our next year's auditor? This is Brian, and I uh, move to uh, um, have the same uh, auditors as last year. Is there a second? Katja, I second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please wave. Any opposed? Seeing none, um, Father Gill will be our auditor again. Okay, next we have a second reading um, of the EL Report 2.7, which is also includes, included in our agenda. Uh, Lane presented it to us last month. Um, Lane, do you have? want to say anything else um this has to do with compensation and benefits yeah um so so yeah this uh i got my mic on so this is um uh, el 2.7 um the provisions in it are geared towards making sure that the superintendent does not put the district at financial risk um especially when entering into contracts with professionals whose roles exist outside of the bargaining units. So not, not in the bargaining units, not in the, the teacher's agreement or the support staff agreement, but professionals that we may hire from, from the outside. Um, it's also about making sure that when I'm signing them up, um, I'm not signing them into lifetime contracts, that I'm not overcompensating them relative to the market or changing my own compensation package uh, in any way. Um, I report compliance on all provisions uh, and therefore the policy as a whole. Um, the business manager has added her letter um, stating the same um, as evidence um, that's included with that packet. <clears throat> Does the board have any questions for Lane on this report? Okay, can I have a motion to approve um, uh, EL 2.7 then? This is Paul. I make the move to uh, accept it. Uh, this is Ashley. I second. All those in favor of accepting um, this report as written? Thank you. Any opposed? All right. Um, great. So that policy is accepted. All right. Let's see what's next here. Um, flipping back on my agenda page. Okay. So next is the quarterly facilities monitoring report. Um, Lane, you want to speak to that? Yeah. Um, so the monitoring report is there. Um, I've actually highlighted one portion of it in orange. We'll talk about that in a minute because we're going to be asking for you to approve some money that's related to that. Um, but there are some absolutely major projects that are going on right now, some of which are complete. Um, they have completed uh, a lot of the work uh, out back. Um, doing all the repaving around the side and behind the building by RTCC. They have replaced the crumbling 
uh, loading dock that is out there as well. Um, that is going to take a little while to cure, so folks will have to stay off it for probably another week or so. Um, they are in the midst of completing the roof, the brand new roof on RES. Um, they were in the process of swapping out the mechanicals that were up there. Um, and so that should be complete within the next week, week and a half as well. Um, the work is going going really, 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 really good. Um, they've gone out and Braintree was the first. They've repaired the damage uh, to the siding around the building and they have gone through, they've repainted the entire building at Braintree um, as well as the small buildings that are on the property. Um, you know, the, the shed that houses the, uh, the well, um, the storage shed. Um, they're not going to do the, uh, the dugouts out there, but uh, our own internal folks are going to work on that this summer. Um, they are moving now up to Brookfield, and they'll do the same work up there. They'll go around. They'll repair any of the damage um, that has happened at the base of those buildings on the siding. Um, and then it will get a, a brand new coat of paint um, on itself and all the buildings uh, in surround. Um, they are also have the process out on the generator. You know, we have signed to a contract um, after the bidding process to get the generator put in up at Brookfield. Um, it's just a matter of waiting for them with all the delays with COVID for the actual piece of machinery to show up so that they can they can put that into place. Um, so to jump back up to the very top um, portion, the one that's highlighted in, in orange up there, uh, this was a mandate that came from the state a few years ago where they're requiring all schools to be E911 compliant. What that means is that whatever phone someone calls from, the location information is transmitted so that the emergency crews that are receiving it, if they get a 911 call, know exactly where in the building the call is coming from. You know, really important if you're in a big building like RUHS or RTCC or Randolph Elementary, important, but not quite as much so in the two smaller elementary schools. Um, again, this was a mandate. It was kind of an unfunded mandate, and you can see the cost of it, about $272,000 to do this work. Um, Wes and Bob, the co-facility directors, reached out to a grant that was available, um, and they received $102,000 in a grant towards this project. So what we'll be asking for, you'll see that that request a little bit later, is for $170,349 from the reserve fund um, to be able to put together with what we got from the grant and just get all the work done at once. Um, because the work was so expensive and because we wanted to wait to see if we got the grant, you know, the state has been wonderful. They've given us waivers um, to not have the work complete by the original deadline. Um, but now, you know, if you guys approve that funding, we'll be able to get that work wrapped up. Um, everybody will be safe, happy, and we'll be in compliance. Um, so unless there's other questions on facilities or concerns, um, and I've, I've signed off on there. I do go out and do the direct inspections, um, usually when the work is complete or when things are done. So the LWMs on there, those are my initials. That means I have physically gone out and inspected. Does anyone from the board have a question for Lane about this facilities report? Okay, hearing none. Um, next is uh, a report on the legislative um, advocacy and work that they are doing. Yeah, I can talk a, talk a little bit. Um, there really isn't, there's a lot go, work going on. A lot of things they're attempting to figure out, um, but not a lot of what I'll say results. Um, so, uh, you know, the Vermont Superintendents Association, the Vermont Principals Association um, put together a three page document. Um, and basically it was requesting the information that we all need to begin planning for the fall. Um, and that was delivered to their hands, um, both the state as well as the Agency of e Education. And the only movement we've seen since that got into their hands two or three weeks ago um, is the update that we are going to be finally receiving a planning template um, with their directives and guidance for the reopening of school. And again, that is expected in about a week and a half, they said mid-June. Um, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. And when that comes out, that's when we pull everybody together to work out the, the, the details um, on that. Um, we still haven't heard much on budgets. 
Um, I do know that there were plans in place. The Senate was um, trying to get a bill um, on the record about the CARES grant that's out there to pay for some of the school's COVID costs. Um, that has stalled, uh, not because the, the spirit isn't there. They are trying to get that money for the schools to help us pay for some of the COVID costs. Um, but they need to seek clarification on what they're allowed to use it for. And in some cases, it sounds like they're also trying to get some of the language changed so that it's a little bit more flexible so that they can support the schools a little bit more. So we have not heard on, you know, the progress on those ends at, at, at this point in time. So those are the biggies. Um, here and you know hopefully you know we'll be seeing some some movement we'll be getting some information that we need to to, to do the planning um, to try to get things off the ground for the fall um, because we really only have eight eight weeks really um, before between when stuff shuts down and, and when stuff starts to pick up again and so the, the longer that this waits the more we're all flying around um, by the seat of our pants trying to get stuff done um, which isn't good so I don't know if there's questions or thoughts Um, I actually do have a question for you, Lane. Yeah. Uh, do you have, is Robin tracking all of the COVID costs? Okay, so then and when the yeah. day comes where you can actually acknowledge and hopefully request support, all of that, um, I'm thinking the direct costs, but also some of those indirect salaries cost, has that been all tracked? Yes, they actually, the state gave us a, um, a code to use to track it under and our budgeting processes, the expenses uh, came. I mean, they had heard early on that, you know, the, we should be getting some money from the federal government. Um, we don't know where, when, or what form it'll shape, but track this stuff just in case. So we have been doing that. Okay. Um, the other thing that it, it complicated uh, was they made statements early on. And remember the guidance, everything, especially the first month, every six to 12 hours, it was changing. Um, so, Early on, they had stated that they were going to be coming out with additional, you know, salaries for essential workers that were at school. That has not materialized, but we have provided bonuses um, to all workers. They got a first round um, about halfway between March 17th when everything started in uh, the end of the year, June 17th, and they'll get another round on June 17th. And this was something that the administrative team pulled together. Um, you know, in the hopes we get reimbursed for it, but we did, you know, check the budget and, and whatnot to make sure that we had it available to do this for, for folks. Um, so that, that was done. That is there. <clears throat> Any other questions for Lane? Okay. Next we have the consent agenda, which I'd like to approve as a, as a slate. So we've got, um, I need from I need you to I update that a little bit. Um, I've been scrambling around on the, the continuous improvement plan. Um, I've been trying to get that done. It will be done by June 30th. It will be available for to do our, us to do our strategic planning on um, July 13th, I believe it is, when we get together. Um, it's about a two-day project um, for me. Um, I haven't had two straight days to do the work with everything that's been going on. Um, it doesn't affect anything right now um, because the state, federal government have said, no, you can put in your um, investments to get your title funding without it. Um, so it does need to be done, but it is not a priority. There have been other things that have been a bigger priority in the, since March 17th, as you can imagine. Um, and the six, six and 6.5 day weeks I've been putting in haven't been doing much, much for my, my health. I need to take a little bit of time and then I need about two days just to focus, get it done. All the information is there. I know it needs to be said. It just needs to be typed up, put in their format. Um, and then we'll be good to go. So that's, I apologize for that. <clears throat> so we so that should be removed from the consent agenda. Okay. Um, so we would expect to see that sometime at the end of the month in a special yeah. okay email yeah. what have you okay all right good so we've mm -hmm. got um the minutes um from our last meeting uh may 12th we've got to approve two new professional contracts which are listed they are a preschool teacher and a uh, art teacher i think it was um there's a leap form um also in our packet there's arbitrage form and letter 
Um, do you want to explain both LEAP and arbitrage just a little bit, Lane? So um, just like title fund, um, the funds for that the special education department pulls in through various sources, um, there are assurances that we have to commit to um, to receive those funds. And that's what that's about. It's just we're committing to doing the things that we're supposed to do um, that the, the, those receiving those grants requires. Um, like in our case uh, for title funds, you know, one of the things is that we have to um, include the money that we're receiving in title funds when we report out the regular budget to the community so they can see the totality of what the district is spending. Um, so it's just the assurances piece. Um, arbitrage um, for the new board members, some of you may know this or may not. Um, the way things are set up in Vermont is, is a little bit odd sometimes. Um, our financial, new financial year starts on July 1st. So we begin incurring expenses on July 1st for the new year, but we don't actually get the first tax payment until probably mid to late October. So what we have to do, what all schools and districts across the state have to do is because they need money um, and they're not getting it um, from the, 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 the tax base until later, we need it in July, we don't get it until later, we go out every year and we take a loan uh, to cover what we need until those tax funds start to roll in and that's what the arbitrage is. And so Robin goes out each year, um, it does go out to bid. Um, there are a lot of people that actually won't do this anymore. Um, uh, so she's chosen a bank that um, with very, very good rates uh, that are preferable um, for us. Um, as well as somebody that we've worked with um, for quite a while. Um, I believe uh, it's kind of interesting. We are actually allowed to invest this in low risk um, investments. Uh, you know, they charge us 1.7. We can typically make about 2.6%, you know, you know, while we're waiting to spend it uh, while it's sitting in the bank. Um, so that's what the arbitrage is about. All right. So... Um, I would like to do those four pieces and then we'll um, approve uh, or vote on anyway, the, um, the facilities funds request as a separate um, vote. So first of all, Linda, I wanted to thank you for the extensive notes you prepared from our last meeting. The minutes were quite helpful. Um, so we have to approve the minutes um, and then we have the other uh, approvals that I just um, mentioned, which were contracts for a special ed teacher and a preschool teacher for the uh, LEAP um, local education agency plan funds, and then for the arbitrage. Do I have a motion to approve those four things? This is Hannah. I move to approve the slate of four uh, contracts, minutes, LEAP, and arbitrage. Is there a second? This is Paul White, second. All those in favor, please signify aye. Aye. Thank you. Anyone opposed? All right. Um, lastly, we've got this um, request for funds to cover the facilities. I guess it's the E911. Um, so it's um, 1,000. $170,349. Um, Lane just spoke to this in our last facilities report. Are there any other questions or concerns or that you want to address to Lane? All right, um, do I have a motion to approve this uh, money then from the facilities reserve fund? This is Brian and I uh, move to approve the uh, reserve funds use. Uh, this is Ashley. I second. All those in favor, please say aye or wave. Aye. All right. Any opposed? All right. Thanks. Thank um, you. Next, we have your report, your superintendent's report. Is there anything you wanted to highlight or add to or explain? Or, and there might be questions too, but is there anything you want to add? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it kind of outlined um, a little bit of the ends work that's going on. Um, and I give my 
highest commendation to the teachers um, are going to be rolling up their sleeves. They're going to be working on science curriculum. Um, a couple of the harder questions that they have out there, are like, you know, if mo the majority of our kids are leaving us to go to the tech center in 11th grade and the, sorry about that. Um, and the Vermont science assessment is in 11th grade. Um, and these students are losing out a year in their science. You know, how do we, you know, mediate that? Um, again, they're revamping the curriculum. Math is doing the same thing. Um, there is a goal in place to bring in some Orton Gillingham training for the special educators. So all that work when we talked about, you know, kind of building the structures and making sure that we've got this K to 12 um, professional development plan. Even in the midst of the COVID-19, people are stepping up to the plate and, and seeing that work done. And most of that work, um, the foundational portions of it will be done before the teachers leave in June. Some of it, they'll be coming back for a couple of days during the summer, um, which they'll get paid for. Um, and then the follow-up will be happening um, in the fall. Um, the second piece that's on there, you know, sat down, talked with the cabinet uh, a little bit, and we hammered out the protocol that was asked for about the hardship requests. Um, and that is in there. It's basically just codifying in, in words um, what we've been doing all along um, so that, it, that, that it's there for everyone to see. Um, so those are the two biggies. Does anyone have any questions or clarifications that they want to address to Lane? Well, Lane, Lane, the hardship requests, just what, what are those in, in regard to? So at the um, last board meeting, the, the board had asked um, for a report and to have a discussion about um, elementary students and families that lived in one district and potentially. Oh, yeah. Okay, another. got it. And again, we don't really have a policy. It doesn't, no one is really kind of interested in having a, 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 a wide policy, but there are some times where it is advantageous and appropriate for a student or a family to be able to, to make those changes based on a hardship. Um, and so this is our process for kind of evaluating those and making those determinations. Couldn't find a better name for 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 calling it. So hard hard tip requests would seem to be the most appropriate. Any other questions for Lane around his report? Okay, so there were also in our packet um, reports from the other uh, high school principals and and elementary school principals. Um, <laughs> there and then there was a financial report. Um, Lane, do you want to speak to that? How are yep. our District, the, district doing the, the financials you know talking with rob and i look him over um if i have any questions i ask her i also tell her ask her and say hey anything that you're concerned about she is not um the one thing that may jump out at folks is on the expense tab excuse me um is that the technology line is over by a pretty pretty good amount um we're not in violation of executive limitations or anything like that and there's a reason for it um, what this is, is uh, we are in, at the end of the three-year lease on the Chromebooks, the student Chromebooks that we have. Um, the cost is a bit more than was predicted. Um, matter of fact, all computer hardware and parts and pieces right now due to coronavirus, the costs are high. Um, but in addition to that, because we don't know um, if we're going to be in remote session in the fall, um, we also made sure that we had enough Chromebooks to cover every single kid in the district from pre-K all the way through 12. So there were additional Chromebooks that we purchased. Um, what we did um, and begged the teacher's indulgence um, for this um, to try to balance out that cost a little bit was this is the year that the, usually the teacher's laptops would all be updated as well. Um, their laptops are pretty much two years old. They're plenty powerful enough um, for uh, any of the work that they would need to do even remotely. Um, and so we're not replacing those this year. Um, the teachers will be dropping them off for a few days. Uh, the tech 
folks will take a look at them. They will update them. They will do any repairs if any repairs are necessary and get them right back into the teacher's hands. And so that was to try to balance out, you know, the additional cost to try to support the, the students um, with what we could do. So that's the only thing that might look a little out of whack, but that's why. Um, but we are still well in the black for the year. Is there anything else you want to add? Not unless there's, there's questions. Um, Uh, not hearing any questions, I want to just talk a little bit about um, our next training day, uh, which is in, we decided because most of you, everyone said that they could attend, that we'd hold it in lieu of our next board meeting. So that's we, we usually don't um, actually hold a July board meeting. So the next board meeting, the second Monday of July is July 13th. Um, we will be doing our uh ongoing board training um, with uh, a VSBA uh, hired um, facilitator. Um, we are going to do strategic planning. And um, it's not something I knew much about. I, I know that I uh, asked you guys to maybe look at, on the OSSD website at the current strategic plan, which is quite lengthy um, and obviously required quite an investment of time and effort to create. Um, it's, you know, so I'm a little cowed by sort of taking this on. Um, that strategic plan was due to expire in 2020. So it is time to do this work. Um, it does seem like a lot, but um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's what's on the docket for July 13th. Um, it would be great if everyone could you know, do a little research having read the current strategic plan and thought about what we'd like to include or not include next time and what other help we need to do this work. Um, basically, Sue Holsom, who is the person who will be facilitating this, um, suggested that the board will convene a design team um, of ourselves and then pair with do outreach to different parts of the community or staff or students to to fill in the gaps for um, different aspects of the strategic planning. So for instance, we'd partner somehow uh, with businesses and community organizations to do mm -hmm. some aspects of our strategic plan. Other parts we would hand off to the administration um, for sort of goals or places that they'd like, they envision the kids to students to be reaching at different points of their um, academic career. So it's um, that's that's what's on on the agenda for that night. Um, if everyone would please look at the current one and come prepared, having thought through really how we how we envision being able to accomplish this. Um, sort of before the end of 2020. Um, I would love to hand off to someone or several of you sort of planning for that night. Where should we hold it? It is gonna be in person. Um, Ashley offered uh, the use of a Gifford conference room, which would be large enough if we wanted to go that route. A second thing I had thought of was perhaps the Rotary Picnic Pavilion, which is sort of towards the bottom of Hebert Hill, um, right before you get to the church there in the corner. That's a possibility, you know, it depends on weather and temperature and things like that. And, and it's, as I don't know whether it's lit, I'm sort of thinking it's not lit, which would be maybe a, a challenge. But if I could have a couple of volunteers that would wanna work on sort of figuring out, do we wanna have food? Are we gonna order in? Are we gonna forget food? Just sort of the logistics. Um, for 5.30 to 9 that night, that would be great. Is anyone willing to volunteer to do that? I see Katja and Anne. Can I sign the two of you up to work on that together? Okay, excellent. Um, so the two of you can communicate with us. I will send you, um, so it's Lane and the eight of us and Sue Holsom, so it will be 10 total. Um, we do have funds for training since training is required. Um, 
And, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how much that would be. It's, it shouldn't, you know, we'll pay for Sue, Susan's services and then, you know, just whatever it costs to, to host us that night. So that would be great. Thank you very much. Um, everyone put that on your calendar. All right, um, it will be really so nice for me to, to be able to sit around a table and talk with everyone and not have to try to manage this, which I don't do very well, and I apologize. All right, so next is this board evaluation. Um, Anne, that's you. So um, I don't have it right up. I didn't printed off because I didn't know I was going to be doing it. But if I remember correctly, part of what we're looking at is did we follow our policies um, and how we did with timing. And we knew going into this meeting that we were going to have a lot of public comment and a lot of, and I thought we actually did a, a good job of listening to folks, making sure people were heard, making sure we understood as a board where, where people were coming from. Um, so I thought we did that fairly well, even though that was not five minutes and it turned into an hour, <laughs> but that's, you know, part of, part of being a board and making sure that we're responsive to our community. So, um, and I believe we, we pretty much heard from most everyone. We were respectful. We were respectful to our community people. Um, so I, I feel like we uh, managed ourselves quite well, given that there was an issue that folks were very concerned about. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether we need to write, you need to write that up, probably not. Um, usually it is stored with a, a meeting um, with through Linda um, and the office. We next have an executive session, um, which will require us to move to another link. And after that, we will have a board development exercise. Um, so probably we'll be moving back to this link, but it's really just um, part of our ongoing training. So that's what will be happening here. Thank you everyone for coming and um, listening and uh, reaching out to us. Hi, this is Zoe. Could I make the request that whoever takes minutes for the executive session send them to me or just let me know that you did that um, just so I can know if any action was taken? Sure, Zoe, it's Ashley and it's me and I'll certainly touch base with you in the morning, okay? Great, thank you so much, Ashley. Thanks. Thank you all. All right, thank you everyone. And Ashley, remember me too, <laughs> okay? okay. All right, so we should find a, a separate link for executive session in the same um, folder where you found this one. So we'll meet in executive session in a minute.